Hi, everybody. Stefan Molyneux from Freedom Main Radio here with a good friend, Stephen Crowder. You know him as the Swiss Army Knife of Entertainment. He is a comedian, political, <laughs> political commentator, and the host of Louder with Crowder, just like it sounds, louderwithcrowder.com. You can follow him on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Stephen, not like mine, not with 16 different spellings. It's S-T-E-V-E-N. His parents made his life easier. Stephen Crowder, <laughs> twitter.com forward slash S Crowder, and the mug club sign up is available at crtv.com forward slash mug club steve how are you doing today that's a bunch of plugs now have i been getting wrong are you is your name pronounced steven or is it stefan well it's stefan uh, and i find that in general the number of insults thrown at me on the internet are directly proportional to people's inability to either spell or pronounce my name your pronunciation has been pretty good but the number okay. of misspellings is truly uh, truly astonishing and i guess it just speaks to people's french literacy uh, which i would not assume <laughs> is hugely well, high <laughs> There's a famous fighter uh, known as Stefan Bonner. So actually, I wanted to make sure I got that correct because it does depend. He's a P-H-A-N, so it's uh, as P-H-E-N is more common. Well, thank you. I appreciate the generous plugs. And by the way, we got so much positive feedback from uh, you on the show. So thanks for taking the time. People are really, uh, really happy about it. Thanks, thanks. Uh, it was great fun, and I, uh, I enjoyed the conversation enormously. Now, we're going to have a little bit of a chat today about our good friends, the atheists. We're going to approach them with, dare I say, a Christian sense of love. And, and positivity. And sure. I myself, of course, come from an atheist background, still self-identify as an atheist, but I try not to be judged by the company that I keep intellectually. <laughs> and one of the things, one of the arguments that I've made, I want to sort of get your thoughts on this. One of the arguments that I've made is that atheism seems to be pretty strongly associated with leftism. And I'm going to get, put out a couple of stats just so people know we aren't completely windblowing here, at least yet, sure. soon, perhaps, but not quite yes. yet. Soon. So according to the Pew Forum in the United States, quote, about two thirds of atheists, 69%, identify as Democrats or lean in that direction. And a majority, 56%, call themselves polit political liberals. And there are only one in 10 atheists who say that they are conservatives. A Harris Interactive poll found that, found that most American atheists are liberal. Now, when I put this information out, uh, there are two responses. Let me get your thoughts on these. Number one, I'm the tall Chinese guy. People will say below, they say, I am an atheist, but I am a conservative. I'm a libertarian. I'm a whatever, right? Uh, all true, right? These are tendencies, right? However, sure. the other uh, response is people say, well, atheism is not a positive intellectual belief. It is merely a rejection of the supernatural and of gods and so on. And therefore, you cannot associate it with any uh, political ideology, which I would completely agree with except for the basic fact that it is specifically associated with left-wing political ideologies. If it's a purely neutral belief, you know, I right. like plaid, uh, well, then <laughs> it wouldn't be associated with... You and Al with, Yeah, then, well, I guess Suss and Gavin McGuinness, but it, yeah. um, it wouldn't be then associated with any particular ideological belief. But it has not missed me in the low many decades I've been talking about politics with people that uh, Christians skew towards conservatism a lot of times and atheists skew towards... Uh, liberalism, socialism, leftism, big intrusive nanny state, big brother government stuff. Is that, has it been your experience in dealing with the world or is that more of my individual plus statistical experience? No, I, well, first off, I don't think it was anecdotal at all. I'm, I'm grateful that you brought the statistics to the forefront because one thing, if people actually listen to our show, um, I would be categorized as a Protestant non-denominational Christian. Mm. Um, we've had professors in the show who've talked about how Protestantism specifically, not Catholicism, has sort of formed Western society. But we always try to be very respectful of our, of our Catholic audience or wh whoever they may be, um, particularly with atheists, because I do think that now, uh, because of programs like yours, there's been a bit of a switch. And my producer... Uh, uh, you know, not gay Jared, who was homeschooled, and I've talked about this, where there are a lot of young Christians, I guess sort of younger millennial, Generation Z, where they conflate Christianity and compassion with socialism and leftism. And so with younger generations, I think you're seeing a lot more liberal Christians who are sort of pansified, for lack of a better word. And then I think you're seeing more common ground between people like myself and younger atheists. I had a conversation with a Christian friend and I said, I just don't, I said, I don't share much in common with a lot of, a lot of Christians as far as getting out of theology, getting into just philosophy outside of religion and, and approach to, you know, geopolitics. We don't, this is a Christian to give you an idea. I'll just, I, I won't name him, but he said, uh, I would never carry a gun because I can never shoot another human being. I said, if he's raping your wife, what, what I said, cause I could shoot a man if he's raping your wife. It's not even my wife. Um, and it was this kind of, 
a lot of Christians like to do this right away. That sets up the conversation as though, well, I would never shoot somebody even in self-defense, so I'm talking down to you. And it's really easy to be altruistic when you're using somebody else's money. Um, so a long time, for a long time on YouTube, I would say 2009 to about a year and a half ago, yeah, the atheists were really aggressive uh, liberals to the point where liberalism and atheism kind of seemed like one and the same. That was sort of early Bill Maher days. And then you see a lot of atheists who've gotten mad with him now for the same reasons on the other side of the coin. Um, yeah, I, I have found that. And I don't know how much of it is cultural, again, because I think you're seeing atheists in Generation Z being a little more libertarian versus um, how much of it, you know, I was talking with Sargon about this. Uh, if it's an absence of belief, okay, so if, if it's a proactive belief, then that lends itself to militarism, right? You have to be proactively atheist. If it's an absence of belief, then that creates a void, which will be filled by something else, as we see with Europe now with Islam, right? If it's an absence of belief, if it's sort of apathy, as you see with, with European atheism, I don't think that it's necessarily as aggressive. Uh, they just, it's not really even on their radar. They're just very unchurched. You have these beautiful, like in Montreal, beautiful cathedral churches that are completely empty. And I think you have to address either issue. Are you proactively atheist, where effectively it sort of becomes like a religion that you're proselytizing, or is it agnostic? apathetic, you're an atheist in absence of belief, in which case, well, you have to acknowledge that human nature hasn't changed and something's going to fill that void. And we see, unfortunately, that can be Islam. So I don't know if that answered your question. I think it depends generationally, but it depends on, on, on kind of which stance the atheist in question takes. Yeah. And I think one of the things that, I mean, I was raised a Protestant like yourself and uh, like the prodigal son conversation I've had before, where it's like, I'm, I'm going to go completely against all of this. And then of course, you know, as a good Protestant, I wake up and what do I want to do? Get to work. Keep working. <laughs> what are you What are you doing yeah. reading this? Get back to work. What are you doing thinking about working when you could actually be working? And this is a yeah. very important aspect. And for those who weren't raised Protestant, who don't have this, you know, you work until your eyes bleed and then you put some visine drops in and you keep plugging away and get some more work done. <laughs> the, the work ethic in Protestantism is very powerful. Um, I haven't noticed it quite so much in the um, pajama boy leftist atheist community, which could be the saving uh, <laughs> well, grace. Isn't it funny? So you're making an assumption, and I would too, that, that that pajama boy is an atheist. But the reason is because leftism and atheism have sort of combined to create, it's like, you know, John Carpenter is the thing. And you, you don't really <laughs> know who is who anymore. You know, who's the killer up here in Alaska? Um, I think it's Alaska. Someone's going to correct me. It's the Yukon Territories. You, 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 you get the reference. But yeah, it's, it's funny. We don't know that he's an atheist, but you see it and people often make that assumption because of what it's become. Well, no, I think he's an atheist because he's chicken chested and has the biceps of a ramen noodle. And and this is not you just are far more brutal on atheists. No, than no, I no, am, no. Like, this right? is this is not just my opinion. This is not just my opinion. Here we go. Here we go. An academic study from researchers at Brunel University London ex assessed 171 men, measured their height, weight, overall physical strength, and bicep circumference, along with their views on redistribution of wealth and income inequality. Question. Steve, just if you had to go out on a limb, would you say that the guys who are physically strong and buff tended to be more into feral competition for resources in the free market? Or do you think that the uh, chicken chested guys, uh, you know, blown over by uh, a bus passing by with a strong wind, were they more <laughs> into socialist income redistribution? If you had to go on a limb without knowing the answer to this survey. Well, you know what? Here's the thing. Uh, yeah, we also we covered the survey more so talking about socialists, how weaker men are likely to be socialists. And I think that, listen, that it's intrinsically tied with with atheism. We, we're, we're actually playing a game. Who said it? Stalin or Bernie Sanders? <laughs> Remove the lining up and shooting. It's virtually identical, the vilifying of the wealthy. But to play devil's advocate, I could see how atheists would say, well, that's because the, the Christians are dumb jocks. So they're meatheads and we're the intellectuals. So we've evolved beyond, you know, uh, as Joe Rogan says, maintaining our meat vehicle. Um, so I, I would guess that's their argument against it. But yeah, there, there is absolutely no doubt that uh, that weaker, more frail men um, are, are certainly uh, more likely to be socialists. I think a big part of that is fear. I think it's a fearful man, a man who doesn't believe that he can provide for himself. That's what socialism says, right? Is it doesn't matter if you're a man. It doesn't matter how, how, uh, how innovative you are. It doesn't matter how intelligent you are. You need us to, to fix it for you. So I, I just think that the, the wimpy guy who wants the government to provide him with a handout would tend to be a socialist. But it is interesting. Well, and if you are a chicken-chested, uh, rubber-legged non-entity physically – just back in the day, you know, when we were out hunting for things for a living, you know, you're just the guy trailing along whining and hoping that somebody's going to give you a slight leg of something that you can't hunt and bring down yourself. You know, like, I mean, yeah. th there's positive economics where you go out and create and provide value. And then there's negative economics called 
I'll stop nagging if you give me something. Uh, and I think right. both of those have played the part in, you know, some people hunt the prey and other people hunt the huntress with whining. And that seems to be sort of, I think, where the socialist stuff <laughs> came along. Hunt the huntress with whining. Yeah, you know what? I mean, I will say uh, the guys who I knew in school, I knew two guys who claimed to be gay. And they are not gay. I know beyond any shadow of a doubt now. But they were always surrounded by the most beautiful women, uh, often nude. So um, ah, maybe, maybe, maybe that's just another evolution of of the human condition. It's defense mechanism. They realize that we can't compete with the uh, we're, we're the runts of the litter. So we're gonna we're gonna lie. Maybe that's what they do. Well, and it's interesting I too. I don't know what your history is with exercise, but I was thinking the other day. Like I really, I was a socialist when I was younger. Uh, which was in direct collision to my get to work Protestant uh, in, inner sergeant right. major of self improvement. But um, uh, when I was uh, uh, fifteen or sixteen, I began to to work out with weights uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking the other day. Okay, so I was a socialist until I was fifteen or sixteen. Then I began to work out, and I mean, in stuff with I was reading as well. But I wonder if that had something to do with it. It's been a constant habit of mine uh, ever since. And I just wonder, because I know a lot of people like Mike Cernovich and yourself and myself are constantly pushing the, the value of exercise and, and good health and so on. I yeah. wonder if it's like, well, we can't convince you with the power of our arguments and the force of our rhetoric, but what we can do is get you to bench press more than a mosquito's uh, ass full of weights. And that you, then you're inevitably going to be driven or pulled towards the free market because you're just physically stronger. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny that you, we, we talk about this a lot in the show, and I think you're right. Um, it's, it's kind of a modern idea that a man either has to be a dumb jock or an intellectual or a man can be strong or emotionally available. As a matter of fact, you were never, you know, because we kind of go back a few generations, let's say the 40s or 50s, kind of post-World War II, particularly our grandfather's generation, they didn't hug a lot. That was actually pretty cultural. That's kind of a temporary blip in time. If you go not much longer before then, men are kissing each other. You know, they're, they're, they're expressing their love for each other. In certain cultures, men hold hands. Not saying I'm going to go that far. But I'm saying um, you weren't considered a complete man unless you had all of the above. You know, we, we use this term a lot, master, uh, um, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. The original expression was um, jack of all trades, master of one, meaning you need to be a well-rounded man and you need to have a specialty. And I talked about that with Joe Rogan. It's like the best fighters now. The best fighters, th there was this idea that there was going to be a new breed of fighter in, in mixed martial arts where they would just be good enough at everything. And you actually see that's not the case. They need to be well-rounded and still really, really good at one thing. We're still seeing that's never really changed. Um, if you look at Abraham Lincoln, you look at people like uh, like Teddy Roosevelt, even though I disagree with some of his so what he did to the, the federal government. But if you look at people who are rugged individuals and you look at their writing, these were these were people who were who were incredibly poetic. These were people who were incredibly uh, emotionally vested in their causes and and filleted themselves open, which now we sort of reserve for the slam poetry artist, you know, at some open mic, and then the dumb jock is over there doing bench press. And it makes sense when you think about you know what we know neurologically, um, what happens with neurotransmission when you when you're training. How much I don't know about you, but I feel like crap if I go for a long mm. time without doing something strenuous physically. I feel better. I think better, and science proves that. So. I think, uh, unfortunately, feminism has created this whole idea of toxic masculinity, and then you have this sort of pseudo macho pickup culture. It's like, man, I don't, I don't want to read books. I'm gonna pick up chicks, you know. I would just sleep. And neither one has, in the history of man, really been considered um, a complete man. That's 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 relatively recent, and I've always been, I've always been fascinated with it. Well, I think the welfare state has a lot to do with it as well, because when a woman chooses a man, she wants two things she wants like in, in a free market environment when a woman chooses a man to be i don't just mean like a, a, a sort of fling or whatever but if you want to settle down have kids right. or whatever you want the man to have resources and you want the man to not die you know <laughs> having resources <laughs> and dying not a good combination not having resources right. and living forever like the poor vampire that is also not a good combination so she would want intelligence and physical health but of course, with right. the welfare state, the women can turn to the state to provide for them all the resources formerly provided to them by healthy, intelligent, hardworking men. And so the values of intelligence and hardworkingness and physical health have declined because they're just not as necessary for the security of uh, the wife and the children. I think, I think you're right. I also think that's why women aren't funny. We were just having this conversation recently with my, with my uh, wife and my mother. And they're like, oh, that's not true. And I said, okay, um, let me ask you a couple. 
name me kind of one thing that you do really well. My my wife is really good at yoga. Um, it's not really fair. She just naturally is, is tall and thin. And she walked into her first yoga class and I said, hey, would you like to be an instructor here so they can take credit for, you know, God's work or nature's work, right? She had never done yoga before then, but I digress. So she, she has done it for years. She's really good at it. I said, take anything that you're really good at. They said, okay, my, my wife was yoga. I said, so you had to practice at it. Did you see the progression? She said, yeah. I said, well, men have to do that with humor or we don't have sex. <laughs> and she said, she said, you know, Hitchens kind of talked about this, but she had never heard it that way. I said, if you, if you were to be given a choice to be the most beautiful woman in the room or the funniest, she said, well, most beautiful. I said, most guys would take funniest guy in the room or certainly a portion of men where no woman would. And uh, same thing, you know, throughout time, this was something that women considered attractive. And it's because humor is generally in, an indicator of intelligence, of, of swift thinking, you know, of being able to communicate and interact effectively. Um, and, and yeah, I think you're right. I think in the modern, in the modern society, socialism is just, it's so corrosive. Mm. It's ironic. The two things that are corrosive, most corrosive to the human soul, one success and two, um, providing someone with a safety net. I've, those are the two things that I think are most corrosive to the human spirit. I've seen people who've become successful and then they've just, it's entirely warped their perception of reality in themselves. And I've seen people, you know, who are getting PhDs in German poetry who just have no ambition in life because they're living off of some kind of a grant. I don't even know how you get a grant in German poetry. I could be mistaking the language, but I have a friend who's getting a PhD in either Ger German poetry or I don't know, maybe it's some Slavic language poetry, but I'm, how, how do you do that? Well, they don't have to do anything else. I think next year it's just by studying Arabic, but I could be wrong uh, about that. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. So, and I think also this, this interesting, this point about humor as well, because um, yeah, you're right. I mean, if you can make a woman laugh with surprising original observations, uh, uh, hey, airline food is not, anyway, but uh, then, then, yeah, then- What's the deal with microwave dinners? Yeah. <laughs> Why are they so soggy? Why are they pre-washed? I didn't ask for that. Uh, so if, <laughs> if you can make a woman laugh, of course, a couple of things happen. First of all, you give her dopamine, right? You, you become the drug addict of he can make me laugh. Uh, secondly, you show your intelligence. And thirdly, you do it in a way that's not going to piss her off too much, right? Like if you start coming in with political opinions, uh, it might be yeah. a little bit stressful, a bit tense, you know, there could be a miss. But if you can make her laugh, you can easily show off your uh, intelligence and the, the plus of, of having you around, which is people will smile and laugh at what it is that you're saying. And and I think also, last but not least, when you get a little older, women, uh, there's a certain phase in a woman's life, it's true for men as well, but it's more important for women, there's a certain phase in women's life where you don't know how old they are until they laugh. Have you ever seen that? Like a woman who's like, yeah. wow, you look fantastic. Good point. And then she laughs and it's like, oh, origami, aging, <laughs> crypt keeper, oh no, <laughs> folds of time thought, and dimension. I thought you could say by what they laugh at, like their cultural references, like that Carol Burnett, right? You know, oh, that that Milton Berle, Freddie Roman. No, but I guess, yeah, the laugh lines too. Um, speaking of which, did you know that they're encouraging young women to get Botox now? Did you know this? Really young women trying to too, say, right? Yeah, it's preventative. I have friends, you know, who live in, I left Los Angeles, that hellhole uh, a while ago. But I have friends now who are getting both like it's preventative. I mean, talk about a talk about a brilliant marketing ploy. It was something that was reserved for old people. Is it's too small of a niche? We'll just tell young people if they do it, they won't need it in the future, and then we'll give them the super Botox package in the future. Anyway, well, you sad. know, there's no Botox for eggs, right, Steve? You know, yeah, you, you yeah, can well, make you can make I, the dinosaur yeah. egg. You can paint it up and so on. It doesn't mean you've got a viable non-raptor inside there, right? I mean, you can make the outside look as fresh as you want, but those eggs, the 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 best buy, the sell buy, the impregnate buy, the make into a human buy date doesn't budge one inch. It doesn't matter how many sit ups you do. It doesn't matter what Botox you've got on. The dust accumulates insides no matter what, and that I think is something that people <laughs> need to remember. You can look younger. It doesn't mean that you're any fresher on the inside. Yeah, inside share. It's like Tales of the Crypt. <laughs> now, regarding atheism, yeah. there is a general argument, which I think is, is interesting, whether it's conclusive or not, we can sort of jawbone about, but there's a general argument which goes something like this. So increased materialism that came out of the Industrial Revolution and uh, everyone living in cities getting better educated, and then plus Darwin, right? Darwin solved mm -hmm at least biologically solved, the, the question of the problem of the origin and development of life, at least for a lot of people. I know there's still pushback and so on. But uh, with Darwin, you had a creation and development of life that scrubbed the moral force from the universe. You know, the one thing I think that atheists uh, should be, most atheists should be roundly condemned for, and I can say this because I've tried to solve it myself, is it's sort of like this. Let's say that there's a, a terrible storm and there's the it's like crazy. Cows flying through the air, frozen frogs raining down on everyone's head, lightning, uh, end of the world storm. 
And mm -hmm. what you do is you, everyone's taking shelter in the church, right? It's the strongest stone structure in the village. Everyone's taking shelter in the church. And uh, you just pull the church apart. You come in with a wrecking crane, you rip off the roof, and you pull off the church. You pull it, pull it apart, right? And everyone's like, man, we got raining frogs coming down. We got lightning. We got cows <coughs> flying through the air. Where the hell are we supposed to go? And he's like, I don't know. I just don't think the church is a valid place for you to have shelter in. And now everyone's right. exposed to the elements, like Lear style, just messed up. And then, you know, people start freezing to death and it's cannibalism and it just goes from there. I think the big problem which atheism posed, which I think we're still feeling the repercussions of more than 150 years later, is they said, okay, we, we can explain to you a universe without God, but God was the moral law. God was free will. God was ethical responsibility. God was the soft fabric that kept society in a productive structure. Mm -hmm. And when the atheists, in a sense, stripped that out of society, I think, you know, oh, okay, fine, maybe you can tear apart the church, but you better damn well have some place for the people to go. Because the storm right. of the world, as we can see from these days with what's going on in the world, the storm of the world never seems to abate. And I think by ripping the roof off the church and not having another place to go, in other words, not bending all of their will and their effort into creating some secular version of morality that could be as objective and as absolute as uh, religious or in particular Christian ethics, uh, I think that uh, it created a lot of homelessness, uh, created a lot of death. Uh, and uh, yeah. I think we're still feeling the repercussions of that. You know, the relativism, the situational ethics and all that kind of stuff. And that's right. my big complaint at the moment. Well, I, I think you're right. And, and here's the thing, you know, in, in atheist defense, um, if they're right about all of it, um, that that's not their fault. You know, for example, if they're right about all of it and all of it is a house of cards and the, or the church comes tumbling down and they're right, there is no God, none of it, there's really no purpose to any of this, it's happenstance. Let's assume that they're that they're right. And I, I readily acknowledge, by the way, I'm not one of those Christians who says, I know for a fact. No, there's a certain element of faith. And I listen, I, I go back and forth all the time. Of course, Christians question their faith. I think we do a great disservice to the world by acting as though uh, we are we are absolute in our faith and it never wavers. That's what the whole Bible is about. The Bible is about dealing with crises of faith. Everyone has that at some point. But if atheists are are correct, you know, I don't really think it would be uh, fair to blame them. Say like, well, you were right, but look, you were, you didn't replace the lie with something. And I can understand them saying, well, that's that's not my fault. It was a lie. Um, and I think that kind of brings us to the question: is is there some spiritual truth that certain you know that Christians hold to be self evident? If you look at the way throughout the history of mankind, the human cycle has occurred, and like I said, there's a, there's a vacuum, and it's filled by something. There's this God-shaped hole that people continually try to fill. And it can't be filled with, like you said, an absence of belief. There have been people who've tried to replace it. And unfortunately, I'm not saying all atheists are communists, but when people say like, oh, religion's the cause of all wars and, 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 and death, go well, on, let's go Stalin, Mao. I mean, these the, communism and atheism were distinctly tied together because communism effectively uh, tried to be an answer right? There was, okay, there isn't, this is nonsense. And here's a way that humans can live in harmony uh, in spite of the human condition to get ahead, to try and be successful. So I don't think it's fair if atheists are right. Um, it's not their, it's not their duty to replace a lie if it's a lie. But I do think throughout history, they've tried to answer that question. And sometimes it's had catastrophic results. Well, okay. So the Christian worldview is something like this, that, you know, there's there's God and there's the devil, and you are responsible for the uh, life choices, the ethics that you choose, and, and how you act in the world. And there's, of course, you know, for a lot of people, there's the carrot of heaven and the stick uh, of hell, uh, but you are responsible. And so your relationship right. to God, your relationship to virtue, your relationship to moral choice is inescapable. And and that the, the question of where does dysfunctional, where does evil come from, uh, is answered to a large degree in Christian theology by the corrupt nature of our souls or the corrupt potential of our souls, the temptations of the devil, the temptations of the physical world, uh, and so on. So th there's an answer as to where dysfunction comes from. And there's a solution, which is dedicate yourself to, to virtue and betterment and, and absolutism. When that was sure. taken away, the logical response for atheists would be, okay, well, then none of that is true. So there are no objective rules, and therefore the last thing we'd want is a big government enforcing these rules in a particular geographical region, you know, whether it's uh, the Khmer Rouge right. in Cambodia or the communists in China or, or in um, Russia or whatever. So that would be the logical result. But the communists came along and said, aha, we know, we know where dysfunction comes from. We know where 
uh, exploitation and evil comes from. It comes from control over the means of production. It's not really very catchy, but it did seem to catch on quite a bit, particularly when there was yeah. a lot of guns behind its enforcement. And so they said, well... Created by people who never had a hand in any kind of production whatsoever. <laughs> ultimate <by>. social justice <laughs> warriors demanding that they be given control yes. over the means of production because uh, they can't get a real job. And so this answer says, well, it's... It's, it's class. It's, it's your relationship to the means of production. There's the, the, the bourgeoisie, the capitalists, there's the workers, the exploited, and so on. And that's the answer to human dysfunction. What that means, of course, is they say, well, there's no such thing as an essential human personality, which, of course, with the soul and with the essence of humanity, it's fully accepted in Christianity. You are defined by your economics, by your class. And therefore, if we change the economics, if we change the means of production, we can then mold humanity into however we want them to be. And the Christians will never accept that. Christians will say, no, there's, there's part, you're moldable, but not completely, right? I mean, and, and right. whereas the idea is, of course, and now we can see this with a lot of the left now, that uh, everything is a social construct, everything is a continuum, there's no essence, there's no biology, there's no essentialism of any kind. And what I think it does is it says, well, we can get rid of dysfunction. You know, the poor are poor. Why? Because they don't have money. So if we take money from the rich and give it to the poor, then we'll have smoothed everything out and everything will be fine. There is this great temptation for secular, coercive, government-based power lust when you rid the world of individual responsibility of free will. And you make everything yep. into economics and, and redistribution of wealth. It's almost, I've made this case before, it's kind of a satanic temptation to take control yep. of the things of this world and redistribute it to eliminate dysfunction, which is materialistic alone. Well, I have a couple of things there. I have a question actually for you, but you know that that we would go back to kind of the biblical parable: "Give unto us a king." And God's like, "Are, are, you, are, you, are you sure? Are you sure that's what you want?" Yeah, everyone else says, like, "We want it. We want to be in control." Are, are you sure? I kind of I kind of just fixed some crap. Um, so yeah, I think again, it's human nature. And even if you just kind of like, well, Jordan Peterson does believe in a God. He was on our show, but he it's an interesting world that he has. We discuss theology, and a lot of people. I I can't really follow this on our show. You know, there's there's sort of a a starting ground where okay, if someone's a Christian, then we know we can sort of discuss five point. Calvinism, the idea of predestination. Uh, but Jordan, Jordan Peterson has, Professor Peterson has some out there beliefs, and it was a really interesting discussion. But he believes in a God, but he also believes in kind of the archetype. So let's assume it's, you know, a series of fables, the Bible. Um, it still does have some answers for the human condition as well as some prescriptions for it. Not all of them, and not everyone's going to think it's correct. But it's interesting that you bring that up because, um, you know, I guess sort of my question is since you say, you know, you, you were an atheist, but you've obviously dedicated yourself to becoming more virtuous. I mean, that's a big part of, you know, this idea of moral absolutes and rejecting moral relativism and situational ethics. Why do you think it is that you've done that and it's it's so uncommon for sort of, I guess, the modern atheist? Well, I mean, obviously, like most people, I invent ethics because I love to lecture people. Uh, I love to feel morally superior, <laughs> yeah. uh, and I love to instruct people on what to do. Uh, and of course, to do that with credibility for myself, I need to have some some set of rules. And I say that it's kind of half a joke, but it's also not. Like if, if you think you can create beautiful buildings, you need to study architecture and engineering so that your blueprints aren't going to fall down. If you think that you have something of great sure. beauty to bring to the world, of, of great truth and of great value and of great virtue, well, I know that, that morals are the biggest levers that move society. You know, if you go to Europeans and you say, well, you see, to be compassionate, you need to take in, you know, 12 trillion people from Africa and they believe it's, it's good, they believe it's right, they believe it's the good moral right thing to do, well, you own them. Whoever defines morality creates almost this predeterministic channel or train track for human beings to follow. And so knowing, as I do, how powerful ethics are in, in society, how they are kind of like a virus or a meme that spreads... I really, really wanted to be sure uh, about what mm -hmm. I was arguing for. And, you know, the non-aggression principle, the non-initiation of force, respect for property rights, you know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not assault, thou shalt not rape. I really wanted all of those to be solidly grounded in a rational framework, because otherwise I'm saying to people, you should do this while having to conceal from them, it's just my opinion. You can't, <laughs> you, like, that, that's really like, <laughs> if I say, Stephen, okay. you have to like pistachio ice cream. It's like, that would make no sense. It's like, well, what is, you, you have a particular taste and I have a different taste. So I really yeah. wanted to be able to tell people the right way to live, or at least 
not the wrong way to live, you know, thou shalt not, so much more liberating than thou shalt, right? Like if I say, thou shalt not go to Detroit, which is usually a pretty good commandment to follow, good, uh, good, good argument, good I've seen your videos. Right? So thou shalt not go to Detroit is a lot more liberating than thou shalt go to Detroit. So I wanted to tell people the right way to live that I had sort of figured out and reasoned through, but I couldn't stand the idea, Stephen, that it was just going to be my opinion that I would have to counterfeit as something objective. So that's why I worked really hard on, you know, secular hmm. ethics from the ground up so that I know what the hell I'm talking about. And I'm not trying to counterfeit off this fiat currency called ethics, which is actually founded on just mere assertion and opinion. Well, I think you've done it. I think you've done a good job of it. I certainly think that you're, you know, you're a more uh, consistently moral person probably than a lot of a lot of Christians out there. And that's because I also think, listen, uh, to, to to Christians, everlasting shame. It's first off, it's not fair. I was having a debate with SE Cup about this. They're like, well, this nation is vast majority Christian. No, a lot of people check the box because they were born that way. It doesn't mean that they're practicing Christians or, or understand anything. As a matter of fact, you can't really be born a Christian. As you at some point, you have to decide. That's the very idea of Christianity. You have to decide for yourself. Your parents can't make you a Christian. Your car- parents can't make you a disciple. Um, but unfortunately, we see this nation as a majority Christian, and a lot of people just sort of check that box to do whatever they want. So they actually just check it. So that they don't have to frame things and like you said to be able to define morals and ethics and be able to back it up because it's like yeah you know what uh he he who has not sinned cast the first stone uh, drinking beating their you know beating their spouse so um i see that a lot and, and it's unfortunate and i do think that christians have had really really bad representatives but um you know it's, it's interesting that you talk about so we're talking kind of kind of about this this void um and here's something too. I think you're obviously a very smart person, so you see the importance and the value of, of ethics and moral foundational principles. And I think atheists for a long time have given themselves a pass because almost everyone was raised with some religious background. And it's like, since I rejected it, I'm the critical thinker. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's the case. It doesn't mean that you're an intellectual just because you're an atheist. And I think they've gotten a pass with that. So I think for you, you're a smart guy. Um, because I also see a lot of people, they're still prone to filling this void with something that's very dogmatic. And we were talking about this today, that the Paris uh, Climate Accord. I mean, this is, if you look at neo-environmentalism, by the way, for people out there think, I'm not denying climate change. I'm not denying the fact that humans have a, have a role in it. But the question arises, is it catastrophic? Is it imminent? And then what proof do we have that the Kyoto Protocol, now the Paris Climate Accord, would do anything, you know, to redu- first off, is India going to respect their demand that they lower the emissions of cow farts? Now, who knows? Is China going to, yeah, we're going to get right on that, right, to follow this protocol. If you look at what the United States is pledging versus China and these other countries who are the other big emitters. Um, but it comes down to, I have, I've had so many atheists who are really, really just hardcore environmentalists. And it just becomes, it just becomes pega, uh, pagan Gaia worship. It's the same thing where this priority, as Alex Epstein has put it, is what's your, what's your litmus test? And for some people, not all of them, but for some people, their ultimate kind of measure is minimize impact, minimize impact. Alex Epstein talked about that. Whereas his measurement, a more important one, that's not one that he doesn't take into account, but before that is what maximizes human flourishing and alleviates human suffering. And again, now we're getting into the hierarchy of values and kind of what what determines that. So I think it comes back to that question that often people are filling the void with something, even if they don't perceive it to be uh, religious in nature. Well, and you tell me something that the majority of atheists who claim to be so scientific, you tell me something they support that doesn't end up with massive government programs and spending. I mean, that's, you know, if, if you, I mean, if you want to, uh, yeah, of course, I mean, it would be great if we could reduce the amount of CO2 that's being pumped into the atmosphere, although it is, of course, plant food and is very good for things growing around the world. I don't think we can sure. have a massively growing population and starve the plants of CO2 at the same time. I don't think that's that's a Malthusian problem that is going to no. be solved by war and starvation. But my question is, okay, if you really want to to minimize uh, humanity's impact from in the first world on the planet, fantastic, then you need to support absolutely no government deficit spending. Absolutely no government debt, absolutely right. no unfunded liabilities. Because when the government spends an extra couple of trillion dollars a year, that's an extra couple of trillion dollars a year that's burning up the Earth's natural resources, uh, which we can't afford. But when you go to atheists yeah. and you say the best way to deal with climate change is to reduce the size and power of the state, also another way to deal with climate change might be, just potentially, you know, go out on a limb here, it might be to not move millions of people from low impact third world countries to extraordinarily high impact first world countries and give them thousands of dollars to burn on destroying nature's resources in welfare benefits. It's just a possibility. And you can see this short circuit. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, I do want to reduce humanity's impact, 
but no right. government deficits and no government debt and and control over but, immigration. And this is where you see this this crossed we wires. The economy into green energy. Germany is selling their energy at a negative price. We we have to use it. The only way we can force people into wind and solar that doesn't work is through deficits. I saw that on CNN today. We're talking about it on tonight's show. I don't know who it was. I wish I don't know if you have the software. Maybe you can tell me off air where I could go back and go. Oh, I was watching CNN at 9:30 this morning, and no one's going to upload that clip. And I would love to do a rebuttal. It could have been Jennifer Granholm. I, I, see, see your first problem is the sentence. I was watching CNN. Uh, that that well, is I, that is the first issue that you have. Well, I you know I watch I watch CNN. I read professional Hospital. hazard. Yes, you're like yeah, the taste tester like, for the king to see if anything's poisoned. You'll dip yes, into the exactly. mainstream media to see if other people can consume it without their heads exploding. Right, yeah. It's, it's the original cheers where you're actually hoping a little bit of poison goes into your glass. And I'm looking Huff Poe in the eye, shady <laughs> bastards. Um, I, I, I feel the need to because I feel as though I learn more when I watch opposing viewpoints, sure. generally speaking. And I also find it kind of boring to listen to people who agree with me a whole lot, um, unless it's you know dynamic conversation like this. But um, – Someone was saying, they were saying, yeah, you know, Donald Trump is promising things that he can't do. Coal jobs. There aren't, in the, he can't bring back coal jobs. Besides, there are more jobs now in wind and solar. I'm going, well, no, no shit, stupid. Hold on a second, because Barack Obama said he was fine. Sorry for the language, but Barack Obama said he was fine putting coal out of business, putting moratoriums on coal while subsidizing wind and solar, even though it's not efficient and it doesn't work. And Ted Kennedy didn't want the windmills out in front of his Cape Cod summer home. It's amazing how many more jobs you can create in a sector when you're subsidizing it through a deficit while simultaneously closing down jobs that we know exist on an off it, uh, uh, on a, an honest profit margin. And no one on the panel, no one just said, wait, what? And that's what's remarkable, I think, about cable and why shows like yours and, and, and Joe Rogan and, and uh, you know, hopefully ours, we don't want to ever toot our own horn, are, are doing well because s people can say, hold on a second, hold on a second. Do you understand what you just said and can you substantiate it? It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen on a lot of traditional media. Uh, but I just, I want to blow my brains out when I hear things like that. Because like you said, yeah, reduce deficit spending. Oh my God, would that have an impact on uh, climate change, but it's, well, greens, it's, uh, 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 greens as well are, are I think hideous enemies of Western civilization as a whole because the the our need to consume energy uh, is what keeps most of us alive. The greens, I mean, in, in a lot, I mean, yeah, yes, keep the environment clean and so on, but it is energy, it is our prodigious energy use that keeps literally hundreds of millions of people alive. Like human beings, we were down to like 10,000 people during the last ice age. I mean, we were like circling. It's like, if, if we're done, if these walls of ice get three centimeters closer, that's it. It's cannibalism and we're done. And now we've got, you know, billions and billions of people in the world because we use a lot of energy. So we're going to use energy. That, there's no, and, that, that, and if you cut back on the use of energy, you just millions and millions of people are going to die. That's just a basic fact. People need to be aware of that. So energy is going to be used. The question is, is it going to be used in a more responsible and environmentally sensitive way in the first world? Or is it going to be in places like China and India and Saudi Arabia, where all of these, uh, all of the money is going to go, right? So the West develops all of this amazing technology for extracting oil and then creates the massive demand for oil by having an industrial civilization. And then Middle Eastern governments, when the West was weak after the Second World War, just scooped in and stole everything from the Western yeah. companies. And ever since, we've been pouring trillions of dollars into to the Middle East, and then we wonder why certain ideologies might be spreading just a little bit. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you can't solve yeah. this problem. It, it, you drill at home and you get oil, you get coal at home, or you end up funding theocratic dictatorships all over the world who have a specific agenda that may not be all too friendly to your long-term way of life. Well, you, you're absolutely right. And something else that a lot of people don't know, I mean, picture, um, gosh, what was it? Uh, there was Exxon Valdez, the BP, BP oil spill was a recent one. Um, those happen all the time if you actually look at just spills that happen from tankers that are going overseas. A lot of people don't understand that. There are spills all the time, far more that occur in transporting oil, as you put it, from countries that they don't have an EPA. They couldn't care less about how they're drilling or being environmentally friendly. Then they have to make that travel. I mean, just think about it. Only 100 years ago, people who made that trip, half of them died. That's why they had 15 kids, because only half of them would make it on the boat coming over and there are tons of spills all the time. One happens here on our shores and people freak out. They don't understand how much worse it is for the environment to be dependent, no, let alone, I mean, ethically, like you said, supporting these, these horrible dictatorships. And, and I hate to sound like a nihilist, but um, I, I have kind of taken the viewpoint that 
there's just, I just don't think there's any way to fix it. I just don't think that Islam, and I don't mean all Muslims are bad people. I don't think that Islam is compatible with Western civilization right now. I, I genuinely don't believe it. We haven't seen it happen successfully. I mean, you see it kind of happen like a, a glimmer of light, like, oh, Lebanon. Oh, it's the, it's the Paris of the Middle East. Uh, and they screwed up again. You know, oh, look, uh, you know, Dubai or Abu Dhabi. And someone just got jailed because they came forward with rape accusations. And I just, it's kind of at the point where, Every now and then they Eddie Haskell it and they put on a good face and we think, oh, look, he's a good kid and they can't get their crap together. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, I, I, it sounds very pessimistic, but listen, there's a solution. We have more than enough energy reserves here. We do, and so does Canada, by the way. Canada is the worst. They have guilt. I remember as a kid, I got kicked out of class because they were saying, they're ruining the tar sands. They're, they're going to ruin the tar sands. And I said, what are the tar sands going to be used for? They're tar sands. If not for the tar, what purpose? Is this is this some is it a bastion of wildlife? You know, they're acting like it's fern gully. They're tar sands. And uh, I got kicked out of class. And this is me just as a kid trying to ask a question that they couldn't answer. So again, they get they, this this environmentalism now has has gone from we want to clean up, we want to be responsible to um, a borderline religious worldview. And you're called a sign. Here's one thing actually that we were just talking about. Uh, today earlier, and we'll be on, on, on our show tonight. Did you follow the story? Um, University of Arizona, the feminist who is creating inter... Hold on a second. I think I have it right here. If you give me one second. Sure. Uh, she is creating... Oh, the new physics. On. Yes, intersectional quantum physics. That's right, because Newtonian physics are, you know, gravity. And I was able to, I mean, she screamed to her scale. Let's be honest. This is an angry, fat feminist who just hated the idea of the law of gravity. Um, I think a lot of people... And this is science should be. Science should exist outside of any kind of an ideological worldview, or it should exist in the complete absence of religion. But I think you're seeing more atheists wake up to when these same people call you and I science and I are simply for saying, I don't think the Paris Accord is going to fix man-made climate change. Bill Nye says science denier and you could be jailed. But the same group of people are pushing the idea of 52 genders, the idea that Newtonian physics are oppressive. I think people are saying now that science at, at, at the, the, the level of higher education, at the university level, is being co-opted by ideological extremists. And, and that's a tough, uh, a tough pill to swallow and a reality that I think a lot of people have to come to grips with. They may not approach science that way. The good scientists don't. But in academia and in the media, <laughs> yeah, that's happening right now. It is very easily co-opted by people who are I – mean, I, I don't know. Can you get any more extreme than this? And this isn't fringe. It's being taught in the main campus. Well, I mean, the whole problem with higher education is uh, there's this myth, right? And it's because people don't understand cause and effect. If you're smart, you generally go to college. If you're smart and you go to college, when you get out, you generally make a lot of money and you're pretty successful. And so people right. think they don't think cause and effect, right? They think, right. okay, well, let's just dump dumb people into college and they'll suddenly become smart and go on to be really successful. Like, you know, take Danny DeVito, draft him in the NBA, the guy's going to wake up, you know, six feet taller by, by morning because, you know, tall guys are in the NBA. NBA, you know, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. So, so they've they've opened up the floodgates to just allowing run-of-the-mill idiots into higher education. I mean, yeah. you know, I don't know what percentage it is. It's, like, it's huge these days. The percentage of people who are going to college, they're sorry, they're just aren't that smart. Many smart people, you know, go to the fashion industry and say you have to have forty percent. Uh, the, the, the most attractive 40% of people have to be on your runway and in your swimsuit calendars and so on. And, and suddenly you have no fashion industry because then people look in the mirror and they see how they're actually looking in these clothes rather than how, yeah. you know, people who don't eat look in these clothes. And so with higher education, it's just become ridiculous. So the government's showering so much money into it that they're opening up the floodgates. And when you let dumb people in, you have to keep lowering your standards and lowering your standards and lowering your standards to the point now where you barely have to have a pulse and a half in order to get through uh, a degree. And then you end up with stuff like this and you have to have some place where all these people are going to go. It can't be the sciences because the sciences still have vestiges of objectivity and it's hard to do, you know, chemistry and, and, and physics and biology. These are tough, complicated, difficult subjects to master. So you need all of this goop where you can flush all of the idiots you've brought in who can't hack it in the hard sciences. So this is what's happened to the arts. It's become so ridiculously corrupt because you just need a place to flush all these idiots to, to shovel <laughs> them through so that you can create debt surfs for the rest of your life by laden them down with massive amounts of debt when they don't even remotely have the intelligence to earn the income to pay for it. I, well, I, that was another thing, right? They were talking about uh, student loan forgiveness. I can't remember the name of the government program, but that's effectively what it is. Like, Donald Trump would do away with loan forgiveness. He would he would steal it from the, uh, uh, was the Pell, uh, 
is it the Pell Grant? The Pell, Pell, Grant, Pell, Grant, yeah. Pell Grant. Yeah, the Pell Grant. Sorry. He would steal it from the Pell Grant. I go, hold on. Interesting you would use that word. Where did the money for that grant come from? Donald Trump's not trying to steal it. You took it by coercion through tax dollars. And Donald Trump, same thing we were just talking about today, where Donald Trump, he may allow employ religious employers to be exempt from paying for what they see as abortificant birth control. Interesting you use the word allow. That means that leftists, Basically, they don't believe in this concept of, while well, we're talking about sort of Christianity versus atheism, they don't believe in the concept of inalienable rights. They believe that every single right is really a privilege bestowed upon you by government. Donald Trump will allow private employers to not pay for what they see as a violation of their conscience. I'm just allow, steal. And it's because they've been in our pockets so long and people start from that baseline. And I think deconstructing it just to go, hold on, hold on a second, hold on a second. Let's get back to the baseline. What is theft? Well, theft is taking something that isn't yours. Okay. Uh, by force or by coercion. Right. So how is allowing small businesses to not be forced to paying for something theft? Well, I, don't, I guess it's not. But taking somebody's money that they've earned through the force of government, that's not theft. And you can see the lights go on for some people. But now that you're talking about this, I guess this gender, is it just being taught in gender studies, the intersectional quantum physics? I guess I was tricked and thought they were teaching it as science to, to some degree. I, I'm pretty sure this isn't going to show up in a physics conference. I, I you know, I'm going to go, I haven't read the details, but I'm going to go out on a limb and just <laughs> assume that it's just coming from some, some place where because of the, um, you know, the standing Kruger effect that, that if you're not smart, you, you can't just appreciate how not smart you are. You know, a really intelligent person, you go through this every day. It's like, oh, I don't know much about this. I don't know much about that. I'm pretty limited in what I know. I like to have my, as you say, uh, uh, jack of all trades, master of one, try to focus on the stuff I'm good at. But, you know, idiots think that everything's easy and they can just, oh, Newton, God, what a hack. I'm just going to overturn his stuff. Now, I think he might have been a, a, a deist. I can't know Newton. What did he know? I, I, read, I read Dawkins once and I listened to Sam Harris's podcast. By the way, brilliant people. Brilliant people. But just because you've read a Dawkins book, just because you've listened to Sam Harris's podcast, d does not a Richard Dawkins or Sam Harris make. And everyone thinks that they are. Well, look at, look at, so look at all these people on the left, right? All these people on the left who get really mad at you if you think that government funded climate models that transfer huge amounts of control over property and lives to government might be, you know, it might be somewhat okay to be skeptical of that. You know, uh, Sam Harris, of course, and I think very nobly had Charles Murray on to talk about racial IQ differences and human biodiversity and so on. And the left went mental. Where's your science now? I mean, that stuff is far more validated than anything to do with climate change. Uh, but yeah. they just go, so they have no particular interest in science. They like using science to attempt to corner and humiliate religious people, but they don't like science when it goes against their leftist agenda. It's very, very much a buffet of love and hate that the left has with science. Well, I think abortion is, 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 is an interesting one because let's get rid of the idea of where life begins in conception. But we were just talking about this. Um, gosh, I think we were talking about it yesterday, but, uh, oh yeah, 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 that's right. Buzzfeed released a video. So we did a, a video on it where it was so misleading. If, if any, people haven't watched, I would encourage them to go watch our, our video because it was just one of those things where I watched how misleading they were. For example, in trying to say that women ha who've had abortions do not have any increased rate of depression or guilt or mental illness, the comparison they use, and I missed it the first time. They say, as a matter of fact, studies show us that women who've had abortions versus women who tried abortions and have failed have no difference in levels of depression or mental illness. Well, hold on a second. They both had abortions. And when you look at the studies of women who have had no attempted abortions and women who have, there are differences. There are ramifications. Whether you think they feel guilty because they've been guilted by their, their church or some you know, outside uh, contributing factor, fine. But that's just a statistical reality. And in the BuzzFeed video, they say, you know, at six weeks, yeah, it has a beating heart. So for me, that question becomes, okay, it's a beating heart. It's not yours. You're stopping that heart. Whose heart are you stopping? And, and how do we justify that? And that's a conversation we can have. And then they say, and it's also proven that babies or fetuses cannot uh, feel pain uh, until 20, 20 weeks or 24 weeks. That's not true, by the way. Um, what well, does that mean? That I get to stab a guy who can't feel his legs in the leg because he doesn't feel it? I mean, the feeling pain yeah. thing is not, you know, does the, does the well, dentist get to drill them. through the roof of my mouth when I'm novocaine up? Well, of course not. <laughs> Well, yeah, it, it depends on the dentist. But and they talk about and they, they compare to they say, as a matter of fact, there are far more there's a far greater likelihood of complications delivering a baby than performing a run of the mill abortion. I'm going, well, hold on a second. Again, no, no shit, stupid. Because complication goal, called being alive. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. The complication, if you're trying to deliver life would be the abortion, would be a termination of life, whereas that's the goal. It's a lot easier to destroy than it is to 
uh, build than it is to create. And I, I just thought it was so misleading. And I think there's plenty of common ground that I can find with people on opposite sides of the political spectrum, but not not from BuzzFeed or Vox. They've well, this so is, far. you know, the, the my body, my choice tongue stuff is a little precious because it's not your body. It's someone else's body. You just happen to be growing it. And like yeah. it's, it, if I rent a car, it's not my car. I'm just borrowing it. You know, I have to return it at some point. And the my body, my choice stuff, you know, there's stuff about my body that I fully recognize. Uh, let, let's take, I don't know, my penis. Let's take my penis. Okay. My penis is never going to detach from my body, grow up and run for office. I mean, we've all had those dreams. I'm sure, I assume you've had those dreams about my penis, but my penis is not going to grow up, detach from my body and run for office. It's never going to write a symphony. Uh, it's never going to write a haiku. It's never going to design a building because it's my body. It's a subset of my body. It has no independent consciousness or will of its own, although it may have felt that way when I was a teenager. However, when you are a woman with a baby in your body, that baby is going to detach from you alien style, hopefully a little less gory, and it's going to go out there, run for office, write symphonies, create uh, haikus and design buildings and all that kind of stuff. My body, my choice. Okay, you've got your body, but then there's a part of your body that's going to detach and do something else. And the other thing too, where they say my body, my choice. Okay. So a woman wants to have total control over her own uh, body and doesn't want anyone else to intrude upon it. But of course, women at the same time want to have fairly strong control over men's wallets and use both the family court system and they want to use the government. They use the welfare redistribution system, which overwhelmingly taxes men and gives money to women. Uh, where is a right. man's control over his own income? Because a, a man's income has a lot to do with his sexual market value. And so yeah. uh, if you take a man's income uh, and give it to women, then you are undermining his sexual market value. You're undermining his marketability uh, in the dating arena and in the marriage arena. So where's his wallet, his choice? That doesn't seem to show yeah. up quite as much. It's a good point. And it subsequently leads to uh, probably a much greater likelihood of abortion because a woman doesn't feel as though she can be provided for, right? That's a big, my wife works at a, a crisis pregnancy center, not Planned Parenthood. Funny enough, by the way, uh, anecdotal, she's done this for a long time. Not one person, not one person who's ever come in and planned on having an abortion didn't know what birth control was or contraception or couldn't afford it. It's never happened. And even when you watch this Vox video, they talk about how most women who have abortions are, are already mothers. That original child must feel great, right? The firstborn, thanks, mom. You, you want to you wanna kill the next one. I, I, I'm a prime example. Um, not a single one that my wife has ever encountered has, has not known or not had access to birth control. It's just not true. And she has found with what they do, they offer resources um, and uh, they often encourage either if they need to put the baby up for adoption. They have families there that are ready, people who want to adopt children. There are, there are people who want to adopt children who cannot get children right now. Um, and they're actually very easy often to convince. A woman is going in. She's obviously emotionally very fragile. And more often than not, they're able to uh, convince them that, yeah, you know what? You don't want to abort this baby. Um, and I know some people will hear that and they'll think that's reprehensible. On the flip side, imagine that. Planned Parenthood, their only moneymaker, really, as far as statistically. People try and say, oh, it's only 3%. No, it's not. You know, every, every service provided in an abortion is considered an auxiliary service. So if you go in, you have an, you have an ultrasound, you have a doctor visit, you have, a follow, you have you know, eight services for the abortion, but they only count abortion as one service. That's a, an accounting trick that a lot of people don't know they do with Planned Parenthood. Since their biggest moneymaker is performing abortions, they can just as easily convince that emotionally fragile woman to have an abortion. And that's why that question, I think, is, is, is so important because it also, it determines uh, we as a society, what kind of a culture we are. And that's where I part ways with a lot of libertarians, even though I'm more libertarian in my approach to policy, is everyone draws a line in the sand and it's a moral one at some point. Um, we can say that's not, it's just, it, it's undeniable. There's no way around it. You can say, okay, I think everyone should be able to, to, to not only smoke pot, but do coke and heroin. And honestly, a big part of me thinks, yeah, if a state wants to legalize heroin, Fine. I get it. I understand it. My body, my choice. In that case, it would actually be more appropriate from a libertarian argument. But at some point, you're going to say something is unacceptable and you're going to make a moral argument. Everyone does. And so um, that's why I've never identified as a big L libertarian because a lot of them like to act as though they're beyond it. And I think a lot of atheists sometimes like to act as though they're beyond it. When I, I don't think any, any human being can really escape that. I just don't think we can because everyone has to make a, a moral choice somewhere along that path. It is a, it's a challenging question for sure, and uh, I am not a big fan of the drug war, but I don't see how you can legalize all this stuff while you still have a welfare state. Because, yeah, exactly. you know, the, well, that's, the, yeah. the, the, you, the fact that you have to get up and go to work 
uh, is is one of the things that's going to limit the de destructive downside of your addictions. But if you can basically take time off from life forever uh, and get money through the welfare state, uh, and now drugs are cheaper and purer than they ever were before, but you don't actually have to have a job to get them, I see that being an enormous amount of enabling of uh, incredibly destructive abusive tendencies. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. I was I remember talking with with John Stossel about that back in my when I worked on the cable news, and uh, they always use Portugal as an example. Libertarians, I said, well, look, they ended the drug war. Look at how much money they've saved. And I said, why don't you ever talk about the massive, very expensive public rehabilitation programs, and the increased entries into these public rehabilitation programs? Um, they say they again they tweak the numbers. They said, well, actually, addiction has decreased after people go into your publicly funded rehabilitation program. So again, this kind of gets to the, if we, if we end the drug war, we'll save all that money. First off, it assumes that, that drug dealers uh, are, are exclusively tied to the notion of making money off of drugs. So if they're not criminals, who will find some other way to make money, whether it's human trafficking or, or, I mean, selling scalped tickets. These are not people who've chosen to be a productive member of society. So there's that point. And then you often just end up displacing the revenue through rehabilitation, because at some point you do have to create a, a functioning society. Yeah, I, I agree with you. That's the problem um, with ending the drug war right now, because, I mean, you can have a bunch of people on heroin in public rehabilitation programs while people like you and I work to fund it. It's a problem. The drug war doesn't work. Um, but I hate when libertarians act as though they have the absolute solution. I do understand where they say, well, constitutionally, we just don't have the right to uh, tell people what they can and can't do. That's something that I will accept at face value. But it doesn't change the fact that it would be massively expensive to do with the current welfare state, even if you end the drug war. And so this aspect, and, and we'll jump back to, to the atheist for a second, because the atheist's bullying I think is something that's really uh, important for people to understand. And I've heard Dawkins and other people rebut all of this stuff. You know, when people say, well, you know, there are indications that Stalin, Stalin, of course, was an obvious atheist as a communist. And then there was Hitler who, you know, it's mixed and matched. And, and then there's Mao and other people. But it is pretty common when atheists take over that they persecute Christians and not insignificantly. Uh, if, right. The French Revolution, right? The Reign of Terror. We're going to have an atheist state. The official ideology is called the cult of reason. Boy, there's an oxymoron that you'd never want to hear yeah, again in yeah. your life. And they murdered hundreds of priests, thousands of, of Christians with the guillotine. The Soviet Union persecution of Christians was enormous. Just yeah. five years after the October Revolution, you got 28 bishops, 1,200 priests murdered, many on the orders of, uh, of Trotsky. When Stalin came to power in 1927, over the next couple of years, 50,000 clergy were murdered, tortured, crucified, literally crucified. I mean, pre-medieval. Yeah. And according to the Orthodox Church sources, as many as 50 million Orthodox believers may have died in the 20th century, mainly from persecution by communists. Now, 50 million, that is a hell of a lot of souls to liberate from this plane of existence. We're not even talking that much about China. China, of course, uh, persecuted Christians uh, all over the place. It's happened pretty continually, and we're talking tens of millions of uh, murdered religious people, murdered Christians. Uh, and I'm trying to think of where, at least with Christians, there are other religions, but Christians generally don't come to power and start killing atheists. But when the atheists do get into power, there does seem to be quite a lot of this. It happens in a softer way with this, well, you have to bake cakes for people you, you know, maybe you don't approve of the homosexual lifestyle, so you, but you still have to bake cakes for them, otherwise we're going to destroy your business and ruin your reputation and so on. There, yeah. And we can see this with, I think, a lot of the social justice warriors seem to me a little bit more on the left. Uh, and, and there is something about Christianity that is more tolerant of free speech, that is more um, supportive of individual responsibility. You know, if you want to smoke drugs, just don't make me pay for it. I want the negative consequences right. of your bad decisions to accrue to you, because that's a way of allowing the free market of ideas and resources to reinforce good behavior and to, quote, punish bad behavior without an interventionist state. And so because Christians believe that virtue will bring you happiness and vice will bring you uh, misery, they will let people's choices play out and they will provide charity, I think, where it's reasonable and necessary and where per a person's disasters are not self-inflicted continually. There is a live and let live because the, the long arc of, of society and the world and the human soul bends towards justice, either here or in the afterlife. They don't need such an intrusive state to micromanage everyone because there is, I think, a naturally positive response the universe has to virtue and a negative response it has to vice. And you don't need six million bureaucrats sitting on top of everyone, ordering them around for there to uh, for virtue to be uh, flourished and rewarded within society. 
I think it's a good point. It's funny you mentioned a lot. And then what's sticking in my head is you said live and let live. And I was just thinking, man, you know, for Paul McCartney writing a Bond song, live and let die was just utter crap. For So it just sticks with me. I have the whole Bond. So I'm like, this is one of the worst. And it's Paul McCartney. Um, no, I, I think that's 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 very right. And I think it's also important to note that, um, well, obviously people right away, I can see what they're going to say. What Christians don't come to power. It, it's important for them to understand what you said. Christians don't typically come to power and kill atheists. You know, if you look at the Crusades, a retaliatory action, by the way, I know you've talked about that and I've talked about that. And uh, it's 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 kind of crazy that there aren't more people talking about it. It's just accepted. The Crusades, they just went out and killed Muslims for no reason. Hold on, hold on. No one is saying that that's not the case. There's like two guys on the Internet. Really? Um, that and they'll bring up the Inquisition where you look, they were killing other people who believed in a deity. These weren't, they weren't killing atheists. And it was also political in nature. And I think in that same breath, it's important to point out um, you listed a bunch. You listed Stalin, you listed France and, and Mao. Some of those were more uh, political in nature. But there were some of those, particularly if you look at if you look at Stalin and Mao, where they targeted people solely because of their faith. Because some people will try and make the argument, well, economically they want to do this because Christians happen to be, you know, the wealthy peasants, as uh, as Stalin put it. By the way, just remove the the killing uh, of wealthy peasants. Basically, anyone at a successful farm, anyone who ran a local business, you know, Stalin had them lined up and shot. Change lined up and shot with take all their crap. You have Bernie Sanders is uh, is policy and something else interesting, you know, in reading up on World War Two and I came across kind of now American, you know, the American Nazi Party. And that to me was crazy because they're like, well, we hate Marxists and we hate socialists. But if you read their if you read their their beliefs, it's just socialism, but it would work with racism. It's just like, well, if it were just white Europeans, we could do free school, free healthcare. I'm sitting there and these people, but like, yes, you you are a Marxist. And they, they simultaneously say, no, we condemn any form of collectivism. but if it were just purebred Aryan people, we could do all this free stuff. The hypocrisy knows no bounds. And again, I think it goes back to that question of people having to make a moral decision and wanting to fill that void. But but Stalin is just – when people say religion is the cause of all wars and the cause of all death or famine, I mean it almost sounds like we're – right? We're describing Stalin exactly. What did he do? Nothing but war brought death and famine, one of the worst famines ever. Um, and uh, – it's, he's not really taught in schools. Now Oliver Stone is trying to praise him because, you know, he's saying, well, you know, actually he did more to to keep Hitler at bay. And, and that's an interesting study. If you kind of look at uh, at Poland and, and the, uh, the the treaty that was signed between Germany and Russia. Oh, but, I think it was um, a, I think it was four out of the five soldiers who died fighting Nazism were Russians. I mean, they, they were yeah. not they were not just significant. They were completely instrumental in the defeat of uh, National Socialism. Right. Well, and a majority, a huge, or not a majority, but certainly a plurality, I think, of, uh, of if you look at the, the people who were killed, uh, a huge portion were, were Russian or Polish. So, um, and then there's also this idea, too, with history, what's so interesting to me, it's like, okay, well, what about the fact that, uh, you know, the Russians put some of these people in the gulags, and the Nazis came in, and then they couldn't afford to feed these Russian prisoners. Who killed them? Is it the Russians or the Germans? You know, there are a bunch of interesting questions that I think history – anyway, sorry, I'm getting, getting off uh, tangent. But yeah, basically Stalin was a dick and uh, he's an example that uh, – it was it was proactive atheism. That would be an example of, you know what? We're going to fill the void. We're going to replace it with this as opposed to an absence of belief. And I do think it's important not to recognize the two and the ramifications of the two. And um, also, there, like I said, you know, we both know there are plenty – well, like you, there are plenty of great atheists out there who think – far more critically than a lot of my quote unquote Christian brethren. And uh, as long as we can have these kinds of discussions, um, like you said, that the hard thing, I think a reason a lot of Christians out there don't have a ton of discussions with atheists is because of, you know, the bullying um, in the sense that like, I mean, I, I won't even get into it, but someone, I remember an atheist debated my, my friend who had a YouTube channel says years ago and when my friend uh, did well, he was accused of all his, all his subscribers are sock accounts. Go, go, go spam them because they're sock accounts. And it was like, there's no winning with that. You know what I mean? There's no, I believe in, in reasonable, reasonable discussion, a conversation with anyone, except there are some people who are just going to burn everything down if it doesn't go down their way. And I think you've seen that a lot with the atheist sort of, uh, I guess, viewpoint that has dominated the internet for a while. It's not indicative of all atheists, but, um, yeah, it's been. I, I, it's an interesting discussion. I don't. I don't necessarily know how you solve it. I think the way you solve it is just, regardless of of belief, um, doing what you're doing, and and more people doing that. At least getting people to think critically, because hopefully that'll fix some of the young Christian socialists who I know, mm. and that'll fix some of the militant athe militant atheists who you deal with. I think. Yeah, I think it's. Um, I will close it off with this. I think. Um, because, you know, last words always essentially, you know, but um, I, I would close it off with this, Stephen, which is to say that, uh, and, and I, I've listened and you've actually demonstrated this virtue a number of times in this conversation, which is the virtue of humility. 
uh, hum- humility is the basis of wisdom. Uh, because humility is saying, I don't know stuff. Like people will say, oh, Steph, you're so arrogant. You created a whole system of ethics. It's like, well, sure. But when I create a system of ethics, I'm saying I was in this field for 20 years and didn't know what the hell the difference was between right and wrong in any rational way. It's for, because because I, I knew I didn't know something really, really important that I ended up putting the work into it. And in this, you yeah. say, well, you know, these people have done good. I don't want to toot my own horn and so on. The humility, the one thing that drives me crazy, and this is true of atheists and other people, when they're right about something, they then assume that makes them right about everything. You know, the entertainers who are like, you know, I, I sing well, therefore you should listen to my thoughts on the war in <laughs> right. Afghanistan. Uh, and and with atheists, okay, let's say they're totally right. You know, the, the, the God thing is contradictory and so on. That doesn't mean you know smack about economics, about politics, about ethics. There's one thing. And, you know, because you're standing on the shoulders of other people who spent lots of time disproving certain religious ideas, maybe you're right about that. But don't think that that makes you an expert in other things. And the humility that is necessary, which I find coming more from the Christian world than from the atheist world. How arrogant do you have to be to say, I'm going to endow a small group of people, all the power in the world, to use violence at will, to initiate force at will, to use the entire structure and power of the legal system, to have the ability to print money, to make as many laws as they want, to make as complicated a tax structure as I want. And out of that, miraculously, wonderfully beautiful things are going to happen. How arrogant do you have to be to be on the left? On the right, we say, I don't know. I don't know how people should live. I have this rule in my show. I never tell people what to do. I mean, I might tell them don't do something bad, but I won't tell people what to do because that's the humility of not knowing things. And with atheists, and in particular with the leftist atheists, this is incredible arrogance. Well, I know how Mm -hmm. we should solve poverty. We should get all the government in the world to take all the money from these people and give it to these people. It won't corrupt anyone. There won't be any negative consequences. There's nothing to balance. This is just what you do. And the arrogance of thinking you can wield the might of the state without it corrupting everyone it touches is truly astonishing. And if there's one virtue I would like to sort of promote at the end of this particular part of the conversation, Stephen, is to promote the virtue of humility. It is very hard to tell other people what to do, particularly at the point of a gun, and come out the good guy. Well, I appreciate it. Listen, I would say the same about, and not just, it's not a tit for tat, you know, the same, same about you, but the truth is we wouldn't be able to come here and have a conversation if it weren't for some level of humility. That's just, you know, the egos would get in the way. No discussion would ever be, would, would be had. It is a good kind of example. I don't know out there um, who, who does Brazilian jiu-jitsu, but um, the best thing a good instructor will do is pair new white belts up with either black belts or the most experienced people. Because when you put two white belts together, they both go in, they think they know, and they don't, people get hurt. If there's no flow, there's no technique. Now, you can have zero technique and just damage somebody, right? Torque their knee the wrong way, and someone who knows how to break your knee can do it, but because they're a purple belt or a black belt, they can exercise restraint because they're also rolling and practicing to learn and to better themselves. So um, I do think that, listen, you've done this for a while, I've done this for a while. I mean, I think anyone who's raised in socialist French Canada has to think about these issues. I just think I've been forced to. I started working at 12. My dad explained to me taxes when I was working for PBS at 12 years old. It stemmed from that. He's like, well, 52% is going to be gone. Wait, wait, wait. So I've always had to think about these issues. And and I think the more you think about it, um, the more you – a lot of you will say, you know, it's a cliche. The more I learn, the less I know. No, no, I don't mean that. I mean the more you think about these issues, the more you actually have a thirst for learning and growing. That's one thing we talk about all the time with this show, where every day we come in and we are looking to learn something. And I, and I think if people go in with that mindset, it, it inherently is is humble to a degree. Um, so no, I, I appreciate you having me on. You know, listen, I, I didn't know uh, how it was going to go when you were on my show or here. I, I really appreciate it. And any time, we'd love to have you back too. And look at this, a- atheist and, uh, and uh, Protestant uh, gun-toting Christian uh, get along. I don't know. I don't know how this happened. Well, I appreciate that, Stephen. It's a great pleasure. Just wanted to remind people, louder with Crowder.com, youtube.com forward slash Stephen with a V, Crowder, twitter.com forward slash S Crowder, and the Mug Club sign up. Uh, that's how we met. Uh, at least I, was, <laughs> I have the mug. CRTV.com forward slash Mug Club. Uh, a great pleasure. Best of luck with the show. I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Thank you very much, sir.